May I request Dr. Iram Naz to actually moderate the next session? Dr. Iram is consultant vascular surgeon in SAUT. Yes. So, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, it's my honor to moderate this session on a very important topic of hemodialysis access. And uh, the rules is the same, but uh, I will repeat that for the speaker, there will be 12 to 13 minutes, and then there will be card showing. And then uh, at the end of the time, we will have a card showing that time is up. So with that rule, uh, I will call on the stage the, speak, uh, the chair of this session. And first is uh, Professor Ziasufi. Uh, he is the senior vascular surgeon. He is actually my teacher, mentor, Still, a lot of trainees are benefiting from his wisdom. The second is uh, Dr. Zahid Amin. He is the interventional radiologist at uh, Shifa International Hospital. Can you please take a seat on this podium? And third, we have uh, Professor Noman, who Noman Imtiaz, who is the head of the department at uh, CMH Rawalpindi. And this hemodialysis access has session has three presentation. One is salvaging failing AVF open surgical options by Professor Norman Imtiaz, and then salvaging failing AVF endovascular options by Dr. Bilal. And the third one is on complex AV fistula by Dr. Nadim Ahmad Siddiqui. So I will introduce the first speaker. Professor Noman Imtiaz to come on the stage and uh, let us know about the salvaging AVF open surgical options. Thank you. Uh, as uh, I am uh, Dr. Noman Imtiaz. I am a vascular surgeon in CMH Rawalpindi. I am actually there. And uh, uh, I was thinking that uh, it's not a very good idea to present a, such a simple thing after a plastic surgery presentation and that too with a lot of picture and that too by uh, Professor Mamoon. So coming to the topic, uh, so I'll be talking about salvaging uh, these uh, failing AV fistulas and um, it's a bit tricky to talk about, uh, you know, surgical options uh, in the era when we are doing more and more of a endovascular procedure, especially for uh, saving these AV excesses. So, this is uh, our emergency and accident department. And there is a, the right tower is officer's ward. And if you go to the top of officer's ward and look down, you can see this very, uh, you know, immaculate, well-maintained graveyard. It's actually, uh, you know, uh, war symmetry uh, of the World War Two. Uh, so I make sure that these. Uh, I ensure you that I have not operated upon these patients. They, they, they died in war. So, but the thing is that there was an era when young people were dying because of the war. But nowadays we see that they are dying of other condition, and chronic kidney disease is one of the those. And we all familiar that it is increasing day by day and uh, the mortality is very high and uh, the very important aspect is making the AV excess and then maintaining it. So uh, there are many uh, you know young residents sitting there so just to have an overview I would like to stress that what is the primary failure. So primary failure is when the arteriovenous excess either when it gets thrombosed or it is declared that is no more suitable for the uh, dialysis. So that is the primary failure. So there are many people who define it that whether uh, on the basis of that uh, early thrombosis or lack of maturation or inability to use it. And uh, the parallel thing is or related to th this is the primary potency. The primary potency is nothing but it is the duration between or the interval between the time when the fistula is created and the time when it is thrombosed or you have to do some secondary intervention to make it viable. So, and 
Similarly, the secondary potency is the interval when the fistula is made and when it is finally declared that it is uh, no more of use and it is abandoned. So this was just a brief overview for the people, uh, the young people. <coughs> so coming, why, why, what are the main reasons why these fistulas fail? There are basically three main anatomical reasons. One is the insufficient arterial inflow. The second is insufficient venous dilatation. And the third is obstruction to the venous outflow uh, tract, whether it is due to stenosis or the central vein occlusion. So we, we are all familiar that in most of the cases, there is a juxta, juxta and astomotic stenosis. In almost 50% of cases, we come across cases in which there is a juxta and astomotic stenosis. And uh, uh, it is normally seen in the swing segment just close to the anastomosis and it is normally seen in four to six weeks uh, after the fistula is ma made. So the stenosis can occur in the draining vein or it can be in the arterial part and the, generally nowadays it is mostly managed by endovascular uh, interventions like uh, uh, mostly plasties and at times even stentings although the stenting has not a very uh, significant role in maintaining this. But at times we have to intervene surgically or in surgery we can you know obliterate the draining veins the stealing veins we can elevate the fistula we can do lipectomies we can do patch plasties and things like that and you know many people many of you are coming from uh, uk and uh, you know there uh, the facilities of endovascular is uh, everywhere and uh, there is no much issue of the cost. But in Pakistan, we are facing two things. One, endovascular interventions are not available everywhere. And most of the, our patients are not entitled free uh, interventions. So they have to bear and most of them, they uh, can't afford to undergo these endovascular things. So keeping in view all this, uh, we have to resort to the different surgical options to keep it going, to make the fistula viable. So, uh, just uh, overview that whenever there is a, a shear stress due to uh, the turbulence or the repeated vene puncture, there is endothelial injury, uh, uh, smooth muscle proliferation leading to the new intimal hyperplasia. We are all familiar with this. And we also know that the percutaneous angioplasty is a gold standard to tackle these stenosis. But there are trials which show that even the surgical option is equally good. And uh, even there are few studies which shows that the surgical intervention is even superior to the uh, endovascular uh, interventions. So uh, coming to the another issue that is the thrombosis of the fistula and it is actually related to the stenosis. When there were thrombosis is mostly due to stenosis. When there is thrombosis, if there is stenosis, there will be thrombosis. And the, the general uh, saying is that the early thrombosis is due to the, diff, uh, di, uh, you know, th this is due to the inflow issue. When there is issue with the inflow, there is uh, early thrombosis generally. And similarly, when there is obstruction to the outflow, the patient present with a late thrombosis. But this is a general, uh, generalization. And most of the causes, it is the new intimal hyperplasia that cause these uh, thrombosis. So, uh, okay. So for thrombosis, we normally do, we are all familiar that we do embolectomy, thrombectomy and uh, uh, embolectomy using Fogarty catheter. Now here I would like to stress that we are very unfortunate in our setup here in Pakistan to get these uh, acute thrombosis patient at the right time. Because it is seen that the thrombectomy and embolectomy is successful only when you do it within 20, 48 hours, especially for the fistula. For the graft, you can even do it within one week. But most of the patient comes towards with a failed fistula due to thrombosis. Maybe there is an underlying stenosis which was not even noticed maybe a week or even two weeks after it has occurred. And most of our 
thrombectomies and embolectomies when we do hear they are not fruitful so it is very uncommon that we are su uh, successful in removing these thrombus and uh, making the fistula viable so definitely there is a need in our setup to have a proper surveillance and teaching of the uh, dialysis staff and the teaching of the patient that they should uh, report immediately so that this thrombus is removed to have a proper results so uh, and there is another set of patients which come to us with a failing av fistula due to the central vein occlusion this is very again very challenging that most of our patients are not uh, you know subject to or uh, the in their the, these ckd patient we are unable to make av fistula is a primary thing most of them come to us with a double lumen catheter or a perma catheter perma cath for say a month or two months or even you know more than that maybe six months so due to these prolonged insertion uh, or the due to these uh, double lumen catheters and uh, perma caths there is a high tendency and we are getting more and more patient with the central vein occlusions and uh, there are two issues that when we make av fistula uh, or we screen them for the av fistula there is already uh, central vein occlusion on one side or maybe uh, on the both sides and uh, you know there is a difficulty in ma making these excess and we have to send them for the angioplasty and uh, another thing is that uh, many of these uh, these stenosis cases are diagnosed after the av fistula is made because normally here in periphery many people make fistula without even uh, you know getting the proper uh, duplex scan done for uh, for the screening or you know for the scanning of the peripheral vein or the central vein so they come with the uh, to us with a venous hypertension with a swollen arm and you know uh, the high uh, flow fistula and uh, uh, this high pressures and we have to even and most of the time when we refer them to the intervention radiologist they said we can't afford that and we have to do some surgery surgical thing maybe a bypass the axillary axillary bypass or the axillary femoral bypass so we are facing this these challenges here in pakistan so coming to the, the, i will just talking about uh, few scenarios that we come across and we have to do uh, these surgical intervention in these cases i have already mentioned that we are not lucky to have endovascular everywhere and for everyone many people are not entitled or not affording to get endovascular things so the the, the case one is about a lady who came to us she was lucky to uh, you know uh, report to us within the proper time and we did the you know this thrombectomy and embolectomy and it was successful we don't these these uh, get these patients normally normally they report late we attempt thrombectomies and embolectomies but most of them uh, they are not successful because either the clot is, clot is adherent or there is uh, swear underlying stenosis and at times we remove these thrombi and refer them from the uh, for uh, these angioplasties to the ir people so this is the common thing i think most of the vascular surgeons are encountering to have uh, stenotic lesion in the swing septum their juxta anastomotic or maybe a bit away from uh, the uh, anastomosis again the thing is that uh, when the patient refuses or not able to get the angioplasty uh, if the stenosis is small it is uh, it is limited normally what we do is we under local anesthesia we excise this segment and most of the time the vein is tortuous enough and we bring the ends together and do end to end anastomosis so in uh, quite a few case we have removed these uh, stenotic uh, segments and uh, did end to end anastomosis or even we applied patch plus we did patch plasties to correct these stenosis because uh, the endovascular option was uh, probably not uh, available for that patient similarly if we come across uh, segments long segments of stenosis uh, where probably the 
angioplasty was not suitable or uh, the IR patient, uh, the IR uh, person has declared that it will not help due to the long segment of the tight stenosis. And many a times we see that the segment of the uh, segment of the vein that is uh, just close to the anastomosis it is patent and then there is a sphere stenosis and then again uh, there the distal segment is patent due to the uh, you know draining veins and the collateral veins in th that case we are resecting these segments and interposing veins we are using long cephalus vein or uh, you know may, maybe a basilic vein or any vein available in the arm and we are interposing it and it is giving results to um, uh, in our patients and uh, you know we are uh, you know uh, most of the time we are lucky to uh, restore the circulation in case uh, the distal segment is patent so uh, in, uh, we are also, you know, getting patients who report to us that with a history that they had a, they, they, they are already on hemodialysis and one, uh, during one good day, they have a hemodialysis and uh, they suddenly started developing swelling and um, it became painful and the dialysis is not possible and they are referred to us. And when we do scan our cell or the scan is done and the patient has already seen that it's a pseudo aneurysm. And many a times it's just a small puncture from which the pseudo aneurysm has occurred. And uh, uh, the opening is small. And what we are doing is that we normally explore these under local anesthesia we get the proximal control and uh, there are many cases in which just, it's just a small hole and we are able to just close it with a 2 proline 6 0 suture so uh, we are you know doing this these sort of interventions again uh, because we have to keep uh, the first dialysis going so similarly we are getting patients in which we are excising the pseudo aneurysms and uh, using uh, the interposition uh, vein to uh, restore the circulation. The, this, in this case, there was a, you know, uh, there was too large aneurysm and there was a stenosed vein. We removed all uh, the, the segment and uh, used the PTFE graft for the, uh, to restore the, uh, the to, to restore the EV excess. Similarly, these high flow, large EV excesses are reported. And uh, we normally do, similarly, we do a lot of debulking and uh, lipectomies to, you know, uh, make the fistula viable. I think the time is over. I, uh, if you have, uh, have any question, so I will, I'll be able to answer in that session. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, next speaker is uh, Bilal Masood. <coughs> He's a... Uh, Urologist uh, working at working previously at SIUT and now has gone to the kidney center in Karachi. Uh, he has a vast experience uh, uh, with intervention formation and then intervention of the interventional period uh, procedures. Um, he requested him to come and do this presentation. As uh, I thought, he was the most. Uh, experienced of us in Karachi for endovascular work, Dr. Bilal. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me here, uh, inviting a urologist in the Society of Vessel Surgeons. Um, and thank you, Dr. Sufi, for making me speak here. So uh, I would like to thank Dr. Numan for making my life easier. Uh, he has gone through all the uh, all the uh, academics of, of the topic. So. Uh, I will run through uh, whatever I can. So f firstly, I would like to uh, explain uh, the fistula circuit. Uh, usually uh, in, in a layman's ter terminology, uh, layman uh, per se, a general surgeon, uh, he would refer to uh, a fistula as an anastomosis between the vein and artery, but we take it as a circuit. And we divide this circuit into three parts, the, the inflow, 
where the blood is coming from and uh, the outflow where the blood is going towards the, the part of the fistula circuit which is taking the blood towards the heart and the middle part is the needleable area which is providing the blood for dialysis. So if you keep this picture in mind, you will be able to understand the pathologies, the problems that, that arise in the fistula circuit and uh, we will uh, know how to, how to deal with them. So if there is an abnormality in, in, in the outflow, the least that can happen uh, to the fistula and to the dialysis for, for the patient is, is recirculation. The, the blood will continue to get dialyzed, the same amount of blood will continue to get dialyzed because of their obstruction. The venous needle will try to push the blood uh, through that obstructing point, but it won't. And uh, the whole of the blood will not go to, towards the heart and it will start recirculating. So the dialysis will go on for the three hours, but uh, the numbers won't change. So that's the problem with an outflow stenosis. But the spectrum can, can increase. The recirculation can cause aneurysms and that those aneurysms can later on form pseudoaneurysms and uh, a very frequent finding of a burst fistula uh, uh, can result from this outflow obstruction. Secondly, uh, an inflow stenosis. This is a very, a very hidden kind of a finding and uh, usually patient comes to, with a failed fistula, with a thrombose fistula and they, and they would tell you that uh, the fistula was working fine until yesterday and now it has stopped uh, working. So the, uh, the story behind the, the narrative of the patient is that the thrill has changed its site. The thrill should be at the anastomotic site. But since there is a, a stenosis down the uh, path of the, of the blood flow, the thrill has changed its sites. It is not at the anastomotic site anymore. It is at, the, at a site more proximal in the fistula circuit. And as the stenosis increases, a, a time comes when it gets thrombosed and the fistula dies off. There is a, uh, there is a chance of recirculation with this inflow stenosis as well. Um, but we, uh, I don't think we have time for the explanation of that inflow stenosis recirculation. So how to, uh, uh, how to identify these problems? Localization of the thrill, that's very important. It should be at the, at the normal site and it shouldn't be anywhere else. It should be near the anastomotic site and the Doppler effect can be there. The, you can feel the same thrill that was produced at the anastomotic site proximally in the fistula, but there shouldn't be a new thrill anywhere else. So the uh, localization of thrill is something that should be looked into on physical examination. Needling site ulcerations tell you about uh, hypertension in the fistula and uh, augmentation LM elevation test can, uh, can tell you about the outflow and the inflow adequacy. These are the clinical parameters and uh, uh, you can uh, use them for adequacy of dialysis to judge the adequacy of dialysis and we frequently use a UDR reduction ratio to see if the dialysis is, is going on adequately or not. If it is less than 70% then there is something wrong with the fistula or with the, with the amount for dialysis that the patient is having. And a very important uh, parameter for, for adequacy of dialysis is, is the patient's general condition. If the general condition is deteriorating and the patient is getting dialyzed thrice a week or twice a week uh, regularly, then there is something wrong with that dialysis, either with the dialysis or with the, the dose of the dialysis or with the fistula. So you have to look into the fistula and the dose of the dialysis both uh, if the general condition of the patient is deteriorating. So uh, we use these flow rates and venous pressures as surrogates for, uh, for inflow and, and outflow. If the uh, flow rate is adequate during dialysis, which should be 300 uh, ml per minute or more, but uh, at SIUT when I was there, it, it, it used to be around 250 ml per minute. So if it is um, 250 or more, then the uh, inflow is, uh, is supposedly adequate. And then the venous pressures during the first hour, the measured during the, the first uh, hour of the dialysis are, are adequate or, st or remain static throughout the, the week of dialysis, then it means that there is no obstruction developing in the path of the flow of the fistula. But if, if the numbers of the venous pressure are steadily rising, then you can, uh, you can suspect a stenosis that is developing in the path of the fistula. That's the needling site ulceration that I was talking about. So it's a hypertensive fistula that is uh, developing ulceration. And if you leave it as such, it will uh, present as a burst fistula in emergency. So uh, uh, after the physical examination, you have the ultrasound uh, assessment. Ultrasound is used for the accessible part of the fistula. Ultrasound should be done for, uh, for wherever your probe can reach. If uh, or the rays of the ultrasound can reach, the ultrasound should be used for that area. 
and if if there is a part of the venous circuit that is not accessible to the uh, to the ultrasound probe then the venography or a fistulography is something that we go for so that's uh, an ultrasound uh, assessment uh, of a pseudo aneurysm you can see the swirling flow in it and that's a, a pathognomonic for a pseudo aneurysm and that's venography for you and uh, it can tell you about the central venous tree and uh, it it can tell you about the cephalic arch as well we will come come to that now uh, i will show you some cases uh, in which uh, there were uh, problems with the three parts of the fistula that we just discussed so that's an inflow stenosis uh, which is very frequently found in many of the fistula as uh, dr noman said 50% of the patients can have a, a swing vein stenosis so that's a uh, um, basilic vein transposition evf and he had come to us with with a failed access and he had a vascat in 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 his neck on the other side uh, and we did an ultrasound examination the need level area was patent there was no thrombus in it and there was very minute amount of blood coming through this uh, very uh, hair line thin uh, uh, swing vein of the basilic vein transposition so we did a retrograde puncture and then uh, we were able to pass a wire through this narrow lane and uh, if we can pass a wire through the uh, through the, uh, the vein then you can pass anything through through over that wire and we were able to successfully dilate it and the fistula was restored alhamdulillah and the patient's vascat was out then and there and he got dialysis from the fistula very next day so these inflow stenosis can can be because of surgical errors as well the the, uh, the swing vein stenosis is not usually the sur surgeon's fault it can occur because of multiple reasons but, but these anastomotic narrowings tell you about the surgeon's technique and uh, these can uh, come to you as well but uh, if you encounter them then you have to uh, uh, manipulate your your technique and put the wire in the proximal artery and then dil dilate it up and that can solve the issue as well Uh, so at times uh, these uh, inflow stenoses have uh, have a collateral uh, drainage as well so this makes it very difficult to approach it uh, retrogradely because uh, navigating through these narrow lanes and avoiding this uh, this this collateral and going into the uh, anastomotic site can be difficult retrogradely so if you have the uh, right armamentarium available you can uh, do a uh, micropuncture and go through the distal radial artery and pass through this narrow area and dilate it up and that can solve the issue for the patient there's an, another example of a inflow stenosis and uh, you, you can see that's a brachiocephalic fistula and, uh, and the swing vein is also narrow here and uh, this is a very frequent uh, finding when the brachiocephalic fistula is made with the median cubital vein and you can see that uh, the the junction area with the lateral cephalic and the uh, uh, median cubital that's the that's the problem area and it, it gets stenosis very frequently if you do it with with the median cubital vein and don't mobilize it properly and uh, the st the stress and tension on on this median cubital vein can lead it to stenosis and uh, you can do a retrograde puncture dilate it up and uh, it's ready to use um, right away now the, these are the tricky bits and uh, uh, there's a brachiocephalic fistula with with a need level area stenosis you can see these uh, these dilatations at the needling site but the area between the the, the two dilated portions of the vein is all stenosed and this uh, you see uh, it's a red anti grade uh, venoplasty we've punctured the uh, the cephalic vein near the anastomotic site and you can see the the the, the contrast is refluxing into the artery and it is not going uh, properly towards the heart through the vein so uh, the trick in in, in this uh, situation uh, or the loop side in this situation is that if you fail to dilate this up then you have made a, a puncture in in the, in the in the cephalic vein near the anastomotic side now if you fail to dilate this up that puncture can land you in trouble and that can burst the fistula cause a pseudo aneurysm so you only do a a anti grade puncture if you are very pretty sure that you can dilate up the stenotic area so we have done that and we have dilated the need level area and you can see the the reflux in the re, uh, brachial artery is all gone and the fistula is ready to use 
सिफेलिक आर्च सिफेलिक आर्च इज द मोस्ट नोटोरियस एरिया फॉर फॉर स्टिनोसिस एंड ऑल दोज हाई फ्लो फिस्टलाज द ब्रेक सिफेलिक्स एंड विद द सिफेलिक फिस्टलाज विद द ब्रेक आर्टरी and uh, it's a very frequent finding in these kinds of fistula and they are very difficult to treat uh, endovascularly if you don't have those high pressure balloons available as you can see here that uh, we have done the endovascular procedure but the waste remains so uh, in these kind of scenarios i am a proponent of an of an open surgical procedure as well and what you can do uh, is turn the cephalic vein down into the axilla and that can solve the issue that can bypass the stenotic area and that can solve the issue but Uh, as it was said earlier that no single solution is 100% accurate or 100% uh, viable for every patient these cephalic vein turn downs have their share of problems and i will show you what they can do uh, in in next slides but sticking with uh, with cephalic arch stenosis what you see here is that this this cephalic arch uh, stenotic area is accompanied with the subclavian vein stenosis as well and this is also something that we see in these brachiocephalic fistulas there is no history of line insertion in this patient yet we see a subclavian vein stenosis here the reason that that we can um, uh, that we can tell about this is that uh, this stenotic area produces a jet into the subclavian vein and that jet can damage the intima of the subclavian vein and results in this stenosis so, uh, so when the cephalic uh, subclavian vein is stenosed then there is no point doing a uh, doing a cephalic vein turn down then that will not solve the issue so you're left with no choice but to either dilate it up with the balloon or put in, put in a stent so we have done uh, the dilatation and that has solved the issue you can see the reflux in the axillary vein has stopped or diminished coming back to the uh, the cephalic vein turn down procedure so the, the cephalic vein that we turn down is a, is a very thick vein so uh, there is a compliance mismatch between the vein uh, between the cephalic vein and the axillary portion that you are inastomoting it with so uh, what we what we have seen is that when we do the cephalic vein turn down the portion of the of the axillary vein which is proximal to the inastomotic area gets stenosed so the problem reoccurs and the patient comes back with a swollen arm so uh, in these in this particular case we have done a uh, stenting of the axillary vein and uh, that has solved the the issue the reflux that you can see here in 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 the in the basilic vein has gone and uh, the fistula is no more hypertensive the the swelling of the arm also went away this can also be solved uh, with the help of a vein patch as well if you can get hold of the proximal vein so that's the stenting of the uh, of the of the cephalic arch along with the the subclavian vein and uh, that has solved the hypertension in the fistula the collateral that you see here are no more there so the the hypertension in the fistula is all gone It's another example of an arch stenting and that has uh, extended into the subclavian vein. As it was said earlier, that you have to stent from the normal area to the normal area; otherwise, it won't work. If you even leave a one millimeter uh, of narrowing uh, beyond the uh, the stent, it will result. Uh, uh, it will not solve the issue for the patient. Now another problem that we say uh, that we not do we do not see very frequently because our end stage disease population is very young. Uh, we see patients in 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 thirties and forties who have a very good vascular tree, so the maturation failure is not something that we that we see very frequently. So uh, the things that lead to ma maturation failure uh, are simply um, um, in in radiocephalic and brachiocephalic fistula swing vein stenosis that uh, just simply hasn't allowed the blood to go into the vein to and and, and um, make it mature. or uh, a diseased vein in a diabetic old old patient whose valves uh, of the vein are stiff and uh, although you have a very good size vein but the valves are not allowing the blood to uh, to move um, in in good quantity so the vein fails to mature so this is a brachio uh, basilic transposition avf and uh, what we had done is that the the, the uh, the brachial vein in this in this particular patient was of good size and uh, should i continue or should i stop
Acha. So uh, the brachial vein was uh, was of good size. So we attached the brachial vein with the proximal basilic vein. The basilic vein, as you can see, the valves did not uh, uh, allow the blood to pass through. So what we did, we passed a stand and ballooned it up, and uh, that uh, opened up the the outflow for the brachial basilic transposition. And you can see that th there is extra visation of the of the blood um, uh, post uh, ballooning of the stent, but that doesn't matter. If you have a stent in that that ruptures um, don't bother the patient and they will resolve by themselves. So this this was a was a old patient, so sixty plus. He, he's a brigadier in the Pak Army, and we had made a radiocephalic fistula. And uh, after six weeks of of, uh, of allowing it to mature, we we saw this. The vein was not uh, was not uh, maturing, uh, was not dilating up, and the proximal artery was not there. The proximal radial artery was all absent. So what we did, we went from the distal radial artery, and we were uh, successfully able to ca cannulate the radial uh, artery in the proximal segment, and then we put in a four millimeter stent in that uh, in that uh, narrowed area, and uh, that restored the flow to the fistula. And then we dilated the cephalic vein, which which had not dilated previously. Uh, with a six millimeter balloon, so that uh, increased the diameter of the vein as well, and it increased the flow into the fistula as well, and uh, it was utilizable within one week after the after the procedure, and it is still utilizable. I think I did it in around um, September, so it is still being used. Now the, these are our custom made uh, solutions. Uh, this is a post uh, venoplasty pseudo aneurysm, and uh, uh, what we did uh, was that if we had opened it up, that would have uh, uh, killed the fistula for, for certain, and it would have given us a, a long scar and uh, uh, would have taken away the needling needling area of of the patient, radiocephalic fistula of the patient. So what we did, we we put in a fenestrated simple metallic stent across that uh, this rent in the in the pseudo aneurysm. So it did not stop the flow into the pseudo aneurysm, but it stabilized it and it remained stable for the next one year. And the patient wa was getting dialyzed through through the fistula with that stent uh, across that uh, across that uh, rent in the uh, vein of the patient. So the, these are custom made solutions for for our patients. Now another uh, scenario, a very common scenario, but the stenosis at the venous end of a of a PTFE graft. I hate these PTFE grafts. Uh, these are expensive. And they do not provide the uh, adequate amount of patency that that we expect to have uh, in our patients. So this is a composite uh, saphenov uh, uh, caval graft that that we have put in the patient. And uh, this is the uh, PTFE graft that has been attached to the vena cava. And uh, you can see the stenosis here, and it's very easily dilatable. And we've done that. Coming to the thrombosed AVFs, and uh, this I is the. If you can allow me to uh, for, for a few minutes with okay. the, the thrombosis. <laughs> I think it is important. Uh, to this yeah. okay. So thrombosis AVF, as, as it was said, that uh, the thrombosis should be done within 48 hours, and uh, we we do not have the luxury of having our patients to us within the 48 hours, and we have we have had patients uh, uh, even after after months with a thrombosis good size vein, and we have done thrombectomies and we've dilated the stenotic area, and the fistula still works. So uh, this is a local solution, um, and uh, this saves a lot uh, uh, for the patient. It saves uh, the patient from the vascat. It saves the patient from 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 an ICU admission. Uh, so uh, here it was a uh, thrombosed radiocephalic fistula. We were able to cannulate it and pass the wire, and, and the thrombus was dislodged, and the and the stenotic area area was dilated. So this is a combination procedure, and uh, we've, we've, what we have done here is that we opened it up uh, at the anastomotic side. We removed the thrombus, and after removing the thrombus, we did the venogram, and we could see that it was all occluded in the axilla. But we were still able to pass a wire and then dilate it up, and the fistula was working again. And after this combination procedure, the fistula was utilizable in this part, and it was used the same day for for dialysis. These venotomies that, that we just uh, saw here, uh, these can be done in multiple numbers as well. If there are multiple needling sites with, with aneurysm and thrombus in them, so you can do multiple venotomies and, and then dilate them up and uh, remove the thrombus from them and then dilate the rest of the area endovascularly. Central venous occlusions uh, can be very easy and very straightforward. 
but these can be very very deceptive as well so you see here that it's totally occluded and the patient had come to us with a swollen huge arm and we were able to pass a wire through that and there was thrombus at the stenotic area we, we placed a metallic stent in that and that resolved the swelling and the fistula was utilizable then and there another example of a, of a occlusion in the central vein and the stent has solved the issue you see uh, this is pre operative and this is uh, 24 hours post operative and the, the patient's fistula is, is utilizable So uh, the, your endovascular techniques can help you uh, plan your uh, open surgery as well. So uh, here you can see that the subclavian is occluded, but the uh, internal jugular is all patent. So uh, Dr. Sufi did this procedure and what he did is that uh, he passed a PTF graft from the cephalic vein into the IJ and the, and the edema and the collaterals were all gone and the fistula was utilizable again. Here, uh, it's a post-transplant patient and uh, uh, multiple fistulas had been made and all the veins were consumed. So this was venous hypertension. So you, uh, you, uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't play the, uh, the, the, um, the video here. The blood was coming from the perforator into the swelling and going towards the hand. So we did a veno-venous anastomosis with this perforator of, of this dilated area and that resolved the edema and the hand was normal again. So these two gentlemen are, are to be thanked for, for all these diagrams, uh, all these pictures that we have shown. Thank you very much. Thank you for your tolerance. Jazakallah khair. Okay. Uh, that was very, very interesting, uh, Pilar. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Nadeem Siddiqui. He is a... Uh, uh, Assistant Associate Professor at uh, AKU now, and he's going to talk about complex saving fistulas. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sufi, for the nice introduction. I am Assistant Professor still. Uh, so, uh, uh, so the I will be talking about the subset of the patients who have been extensively dealt with by Dr. Noman and Dr. Bilal. All of the open and the endovascular options have been explored, exhausted, and now we are left with this type of, <clears throat> this subset of dialysis patient. The uh, scientific committee, when they forward me this uh, topic about complex AVF. So, uh, and when I start to look, what is complex AVF? And believe me or not, there is no term <laughs> that complex AVF. But when I thought about it more, I think each and every fistula is a complex fistula. It can become a complex fistula. We all do AV fistulas. Even a simplest of brachiocephalic fistula can give us a very hard time. You find synechia at the time of dissection. You find bad arteries uh, and you are stuck. So, uh, and multiple on table thrombosis and everything. So each and every thing can become nightmare. Similarly, even the complex of the fistula can go in a very smooth manner, obviously with the good technique and it can, it can be just a piece of the cake. So it can be everything or it can be nothing. But when I look more that, because I know what type of subsets of the patient I have to talk about. So there were two further terms which came. So these are the terms like the patients dealt by now Dr. Noman and Dr. Bilal, patient who have exhausted veins or the AVF of last resort. And what do you mean by such patient is that AVF consideration in those patients who have multiple axis failures, who have central history, of, uh, history of central uh, venous stenosis, multiple venoplasty, stent placement, and this, despite that, not working out for them. Inadequate peripheral veins, insufficient arteries, and uh, because of the peripheral arterial disease, and maybe because of the body habitus. So these are the type of the patient which we'll be talking about who have been um, through uh, multiple surgeries and multiple uh, things throughout their life. <clears throat> so we know that a life expectancy thanks to the recent advances in the medicine is increasing even in these sick patients. And on one hand, it is good to see about it, but on the other hand, for the life of the vascular surgeon is becoming more difficult 
not only for the ESRD patient, but also for the patient who have peripheral arterial disease. The, the, the challenge of tackling these patients are, is difficult. And because of this increasing life expectancy, which has been reported by, by multiple uh, evidence, we see patients and we have to make more AVF in elderly population, which have their own set of problems. They have multiple AV fistulas, multiple line placements. They, many of them have undergone transplant and after transplant, uh, 10 years of transplant, they have got transplant rejection and now come in with for second fistulas and obviously the disease arteries. So these are the patients in which we have to make a dialysis axis. So the question arises, when are complex fistula indicated? And the simple, simplest answer is then when all the conventional options are exhausted. And this brings to the next question, conventional options. What are conventional options? So conventional options to general understanding is the simple upper arm AV fistulas, either uh, prost uh, autogenous or, or prosthetic, brachiocephalic, basilic, simple AV bridge graft, radiocephalic fistulas. Uh, so when those options are exhausted, then we have to think about these complex AV fistula. And I'm going to use this term complex AV fistula because it's for the sake of uh, uh, simplicity. And now when you have to see such patients, can so what are the considerations you have to look for? And Bilal has nicely pointed out that the things which you have to look for is the inflow, outflow, and conduit. And how you are going to look for is, the most important thing is the history. Each and every fistula has a story. Do spend time with the patient so that you know each and every uh, ruptured fistula, will, they will tell you a story about it. Examination is very important. Each and every scar gives you a story. And it is very important to know that what you are dealing with, what have been done in these patients, and unfortunately, because of the absence of the good medical record keeping system, we only have to rely on the patient, what patient is telling us. We don't have electronic health record in our uh, setup. And also the judicious use of investigations. So what does it mean is that uh, use ultrasound, use venograms and uh, other modalities to make sure that what you are dealing with. And as Dr. Sufi has taught us, think like a plumber. You need to get some blood from somewhere and you have to drain it somewhere in a way that you should be able to put some conduit which can, on a foundation which can support the conduit. So, so think like a plumber. It's, it's like enjoying the two arteries. And I, I do remember that all the time. And um, we have to really think like a plumber. Get an inflow, get an outflow in, the, in, the, in this. And while joining them, make sure that you have a suitable foundation where you can put the uh, needles on. So I will be discussing about the cases. Some, most of them are uh, done by us, but some of them are not. And I will try to use those cases in a systematic way so that we have an understanding that uh, how to algorithmically, how to systematically evaluate these patients and uh, what options we can offer to them. So this is one of the patient. I'm not going into the detail and you can all see. So the, what we can see here is uh, thrombosed subclavian artery. But what you can also see is that SVC is probably patent. So what we are dealing with here is uh, axillary uh, vein thrombosis or the subclavian vein thrombosis with the brachiocephalic trunk th uh, occlusion. Similarly, on the other patient, so this is the left side, you can see nominate vein occlusion, but again, SVC and the right side is patent and same here. So these are the subset of patient in which there is a subclavian vein or the brachiocephalic vein occlusion with a patent SVC. And uh, how many trainees we have by the raise of hands. Okay, option for this patient. And the patient do not want fistula on the lower limb, upper limb option. So, so suppose this patient. Let's talk about this patient. So he has multiple fistulas on the left side like brachiocephalic, basilic, AVBGs, thrombectomies have been done. Now what, what options do we have here? Hero graft, one option, absolutely. Any other, any other volunteer? So yeah, hero graft. Hero graft, we all know that you access the main uh, vein and uh, there, is a, there, there is a tubing part and this is the part which is used for uh, cannulation and this is the 
graft to brachial artery anastomosis and you can access the central vein either through the jugular vein or directly to the subclavian vein to the patent part and you can just uh, place the uh, outflow part in the right atrium. Any other option for this patient? What about necklace graft? So if, so necklace graft is what? That you take the inflow from one side which is, which is blocked and you give outflow on the opposite side. So you, and the graft runs on the, is on the chest wall. So this is the necklace graft which you can use. Also, you can use that fistula, maybe basal transposition or the brachycephalic fistula to the ipsilateral or the contralateral jugular vein. You can, as Bilal pointed out, you can use PTFE graft or you can use uh, uh, autogenous or even some cases you can uh, transpose the jugular vein uh, uh, towards the ipsilateral subclavian vein. So these are some of the options which you can use in patients who have ipsilateral or the unilateral subclavian vein and brachycephalic trunk stenosis, but the contralateral site is open. Important things when you do this procedure is obviously, I don't want to go into detail, the meticulous handling, tissue handling, everything is about when you, you talk about this. So when you cross the joint lines, so the, the lay of the uranastomosis is important. Either you want to go retro jugular or the anti jugular, that's another consideration. And there is no clear cut answer to this that in front of the jugular vein or the behind the jugular vein, how, how you uh, retract uh, the mastoid. But the important thing is that your lay should be important. And while you are rotating the neck, there should not be any kinking. So this is the patient who have ipsilateral jugular vein patent, but tight stenosis Bilal has done many venoplasties in this patient and obviously it recurs again. So what we can offer here is that if you have established that the jugular vein to the SVC path is patent, then you can transpose the jugular vein onto the, um, with the subclavian vein, with the cephalic vein or the draining vein, or you can put the PTFE graft. Okay. Coming to the next subset of patient, now here what we can see here is that the SVC is blocked. So, so there is a significant disease in the superior vena cava. So there is a, there is a subclavian vein, brachycephalic nominate vein occlusion along with no SVC drainage. So what are the options here? Again, fellows. So subclavian vein to iliac vein. Um, Absolutely. Anything else? Sorry? As a superficial femoral vein transposition. Very good. You can use saphenous vein transposition, long saphenous vein transposition. And obviously, if the if the autogenous axis are not available, you can always use PT, uh, the, the graft or the uh, prosthetic material in a C-shaped manner or a U-shaped manner, uh, depending on the habitus of the patient. So, now the important technical consideration in this patient is uh, how you dissect it, how you how how you gonna lay these patients, how you gonna take the adequate length of the conduit because in the patient who is of a small stature, the length of the vein uh, is not probably adequate, and also uh, um, um, the the tunneling of the uh, these grafts. Uh, so this is these are the options in patients who have SVC obstruction uh, occlusion. Also, there is a reports that you can use posterior tibial vein to the saphenous vein if in a thin lean patient that can act as a fistula. And obviously, as the one of the colleagues said, from subclavian vein or the axillary vein to uh, femoral vein or the iliac vein uh, grafting. There is another subset of patient in which both SVC and IVC, the patient who have both IVC as well as SVC obstruction. Here, we have femoral atrial, direct anastomosis to the atrial, although I know it sounds invasive, but this is one of the options. So from femoral artery to the, to the right atrium. So this is one option in uh, such patient. But sometimes, despite all these things, we do not have any other options. And we, that catheter is the only option. And in these patients with sub, sub, superior vena cave obstruction, IVC obstruction, the catheter placement is difficult. And some of the options for difficult choices of catheter placement is translumbar catheter. You puncture through the lumbar and into the IVC and place the catheter in the IVC. And this is how it's gonna look like. Similarly, 
trans hepatic you puncture like just like ptc you access to the ivc and place the through the liver place the catheter into the ivc trans renal or trans azygous vein catheters and intra arterial catheter that you you, you just like a lumbar rather than going the tip downwards you go you take the tip upwards all the way to the right atrium so um, uh, so these are some of the catheter options in such patients not very good options not very durable options but these are some of the options and sometimes if all of this again can fail you always have to keep in mind that there is an option of peritoneal dialysis which is available now which is quite feasible now for these patients and patient can uh, do it at home but the important thing about pd is that you have to anticipate if you are finding problems with these patient you have to start counseling the patient you have to start that patient might be might be needing that they have just should have a catheter in place so that it can have a maturation time and so you have to anticipate and prepare for them this is just a schematic representation we have just discussed patient with subclavian cephalic vein obstruction what are the options patient with svc obstruction patient with combined svc and ivc obstruction so these are just the things which we have just discussed and this has been supported by literature although literature is not in the form of a very good class evidence these are most of the case series and the uh, anecdotal experiences but the see, there seems that the patency of the catheters and cephalic vein loop graft seems to be uh, on the higher side as compared to other options so my two cents for these type of patient is you have to plan cautiously and the planning is most important thing if you it's like a going in the battlefield if you go unprepared you are bound to lose if you plan to fail if you fail to plan you plan to fail so you know where you should be taking from inflow from where should be the outflow and what will be the conduit and then when you plan it and when you are executing it do it meticulously so if the vein how you harvest the vein how you do the dissections how you tunnel it absolute meticulousness talking with the patient is extremely important communicate tell them the realistic outcomes that who, these are not the simple patients these are elderly patients what are the outcomes of these fistulas what are the possible complications especially the lower limb graft the risk of infection should always be told the risk of limb loss the patient pulses should always be monitored and they, 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 this is an, another important aspect so communicate with them effectively and once you have made this fistula follow up, follow up with them and this is also important do not just forget those patients okay and uh, do not just forget these patient ask them in the clinics because if you follow them quickly you will be able to reintervene at the right time before the fistula blocks so you have to reintervene at the time in which they are just starting to the shines of venous intimal hyperplasia so i remember the patient with the ivc to femoral artery graft in which we do used to do all the time uh, every six monthly or one yearly uh, angioplasties uh, even in the ors so reintervene uh, judiciously so these are some of the references which i have used uh, thank you for your patience listening and i think questions this is the end of the session if there are any questions feel free to ask thank you uh, thank you dr nadeem for an excellent uh, presentation um now we'll take questions is there are there any questions from the audience so actually we have taken the 15 minutes from the organizer from the coffee break so we have only 15 minutes go ahead Go ahead, Dr. Farid. Thank you very much uh, for that interesting session. Uh, I have a question for Bilal, uh, Dr. Bilal. So I am one of the proponents for the endovascular first approach for a failing fistula as well. Uh, but I wonder how often do you see those patients coming back to you? Because we know they recur uh, after the angioplasty, and and in a setting like Pakistan, I know at S I U T you were privileged to have. like a supported system but now you are at kidney center so how is your experience like how do patients afford that actually we are in the process of developing it at the kidney center and the kidney center itself is also a welfare hospital and uh, we offer procedures at discounted rates and at uh, at a sharing basis with the patient so although it is the system is there as well but uh, the the system uh, of endovascular surgery is still in the process of evolution there the the equipments are are to be procured all of them are not there but uh, we can uh, do some of the simple procedures there 
but you're right and uh, it is a very b- big consideration that um, uh, if you're expecting uh, a bad result from your endovascular surgery then um, in in my personal experience i don't go for an endovascular surgery and i, and I opt for an open surgical option either a new fistula or, or or a vein patch if the stenosis is too tight or too long and, and I'm, I'm i'm expecting that the stenosis will reoccur again uh, very soon then uh, a vein patch is a very viable option and uh, it has good results so you can put put a patch at the cephalic arch you can p- put a patch in the in the axillary vein as i just said that uh, the stent in the axillary vein if you can get hold of the proximal uh, part of the vein the proximal normal part of the vein you can put a vein patch there so that can solve the issue and that can solve the issue for a longer period of time as compared to an endovascular uh, option so you're right uh, that that is a consideration when you're planning endovascular surgery any other question dr elias yeah my question to dr bilal again you mentioned something uh, like cephalic vein turn down so can you explain that to see a bit so uh, the problem is with the cephalic arch the part of the cephalic vein that is turning down uh, at the deltopectoral groove and joining the axillary vein and making the subclavian vein so if the subclavian vein is vein is all normal what we do is we, we detach the the cephalic vein uh, somewhere uh, near the shoulder and then we turn it uh, t- uh, twist it into the axilla and then we attach it to the uh, axillary vein that bypasses that uh, narrowing in the cephal- cephalic arch although it kinds of recreate the uh, the the cephalic arch but that can solve the issue for the time being and uh, we've seen that uh, it it takes a lot of uh, time before the problem can reoccur and uh, it's a good solution for for this nagging kind of a problem for of cephalic arch dr choksi has a question yeah, i just wanted to ask um do you have any experience of the drug eluting balloon for the uh, for recurrent stenosis at all what is your question we have used them but uh, they came in donation so uh, we don't have them in, in in larger quantities to actually see the effect of those dr- drug elution but uh, our seniors th- th- those who have used it they say that the drug elution helps in in, uh, in delaying the recurrence of the stenosis dr Khal- uh, khalil at the back i have a question for dr bilal uh, how uh, the when the uh, thrombus uh, we have reported late and we, are, uh, we do a procedure with an intervention how is their patency uh, in this uh, we have work uh, coming late in it's a very relevant question for for our uh, pakistani audience and uh, as i said that the patients uh, we don't have the luxury of having our patients within the 48 hours time period so we have had patients who have had come who have had come to us um, one month after thrombosis i remember one patient uh, who had a thrombosis bvt and uh, had a vascat on the same side and was planned for a bvt on the on the next uh, other hand so and that was one month post uh, thrombosis so i i saw him in the in the ward and i i said that it, it's a very dilated uh, kind of a vein uh, we can remove the thrombus and probably dilate the stenotic area so we were uh, successfully able to do that and uh, salvage the fistula and uh, it was still uh, functioning 3 months on so uh, we have a data series for for that and uh, we have done a research on that we are in the process of publishing it and we have seen that uh, the duration of thrombosis uh, b- for these patient does not uh, directly impact the and the patency rates of these fistulas what uh, does impact the patency rate of this fistula are the problems in the fistula as the number of problems in these fistulas increases the chances of gaining patency again decrease so if you have only an outflow stenosis with, with a dilated need level area and a good anastomotic side that the, this kind of a thrombosis fistula even if it comes to you after one month has a very good chance of of salvage but if you have an old fistula with an inflow stenosis with a stenosis in the need level area and an outflow that is cranked up uh, up as well so this kind of fistula uh, uh, will take some doing for for salvaging it may i 
asking if you have any experience of using a TBA or thrombolysis these kind of things. And can I ask this question from my radiological colleague? So, so we do perform uh, uh, TPA uh, thrombolysis for fistulas. So it's uh, most effective within the first two to three days, but you can do it up to a week. Uh, so the TPA infusion, it's around 50 to 75,000 for the TPA itself. We have a fountain catheter, which is a 15 or 20 centimeter catheter with multiple side holes. And you start the infusion at different rates, uh, uh, depending on whether you want to do a high dose or a low dose. And invariably, you get a reasonable response. Now, it may take 12 hours, 24 hours, or 48 hours. The only problem is the cost, because when you're starting TPA, the patient has to be in step down. Well, sort of not ICU, but step down, so you're incurring those costs. And then we have to supplement it either with a mechanical thrombectomy device or balloon ma maceration. So it's very effective, it's very good, it's uh, practiced in many places, especially where you don't have the super expensive mechanical thrombectomy devices, which we don't have in Pakistan. I think there is one of them lying in, in one of the government hospitals in the storeroom for the last couple of years. Uh, so, but this is the second best option. Uh, and we do, we do quite a few cases. So last question from Dr. Khalil. I have another again question from Dr. Bilal. Uh, Dr. Bilal, what's your experience in the cephalic arch stenosis and in between endovascular and open turn down, uh, turn down the cephalic vein? What was your experience in there? I'm a proponent for open surgery in that. Uh, I see that uh, a simple uh, turn down can save the cost. And uh, it has good patency rate as compared to a, a, a venoplasty, simple venoplasty at the arch. So a simple venoplasty at the arch has a, has a high recurrence rate. So you will be needing to do, uh, to do that again in, one, in three months time. So a turn down is, is, is I'm in favor of a turn down in, in a cephalic arch stenosis. But as I just said, if it is accompanied by a subclavian vein stenosis, then that option goes away. You don't have that option anymore. There's a final comment. So not a comment, I mean, I would just extend this discussion on cephalic turndown and it's a for the journal audience, uh, for very senior colleagues are sitting here. So when you do a cephalic turndown, in order to keep the adequate length for needling, you end up and having a good angulation, you end up doing the anastomosis in quite proximal axillary vein. Now what it will do is that if, and we know that the new intimal hypoclosis is going to happen. So what you do is that if after three months, six months, uh, nine months, again, because of the angulation, new intimal hypoglase happens, it precludes the future fistula options like basilic transposition or even AVBG. So what is the thought about this? Whether we can consider using a PTFE graft 80 millimeter uh, to divert it because that PTFE graft can be used later on as a conduit to uh, to make a break your axillary bridge graft and just, uh, discussion uh, to, to discuss. Thank you. I think we had a very um, interactive sessions as well. And I remember from my experience that, uh, you know, patient comes to you and this is their lifeline. So they want to have everything done, endovascular, open, combined, hybrid, whatever you name it, and we have to provide. And after joining the high volume center at SIUT, I can now say that there are endless, like many more possibilities, which we usually see in a separate uh, hospital, which is kind of a private and uh, where the patient has to pay the cost. With that, uh, I hope you all uh, enjoyed it. And uh, for final comments, I will go to the chair uh, to conclude the session. Okay, to all the participants, thank you very much. It was a very interesting session and it's been a major problem. And uh, we, we are now being associated with this IUT, we have a steady flow of patients and we are able to modify our uh, procedures accordingly. The interesting thing is that uh, this is at no cost to the patient at all, uh, but our limits, our sources are limited and we have to beg, borrow and steal to get our catheters. <laughs> Etc. Or for this, um, 
One one word of caution is we hear is uh, fistula surveillance. I think that is the most important thing after making a fist. Well, the first thing is that the first fistula is the best fistula. So it should be made by the senior most, not the resident or the fellow. Or if the fellow is making it, the surgeon should be with the patient. Well, that is the most important. Selection, of course, and then that. And after that comes fistula surveillance with programs set up in the diet center, etc. And then you can cut down on a lot of these problems that we are seeing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Zia has an announcement. Thank you so much.